Hi, I'm Rosemary Clay, the Executive Director for the Bergen Newbridge Medical Center Foundation, New Jersey's largest not-for-profit hospital and the sponsor of In the Know It Row, an informative conversation with leading clinicians on important health topics. September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and today I am joined by Bergen Newbridge Medical Center's Wellness Navigation Specialist, Darian Aletta, and together we will try to raise awareness on the stigmatized and traditionally taboo topic. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young adults and the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States. The stress and mental health challenges brought on by COVID-19 has made it even more important than ever to have an honest conversation about mental health conditions and suicide. Thank you, Darian, for joining me today and helping to let everyone know it is okay to talk about suicide. So let's get to it. Thanks for having me, Ro. <laughs> so why do people attempt suicide? So there's many reasons that someone might have suicidal ideation or have any kind of suicidal attempt in their life. You know, there's different factors that could play a role financial, emotional, spiritual, um, life stressors, loss, grief. There's so many things that play a role in people in, in someone's motivation to have suicidal ideation or or to move forward with suicide. Um, but many times it is an attempt to end someone's suffering. You know, if someone is considering suicide, there is a very big chance that they have been suffering emotionally for a long time, or maybe there's something that's happened in their life that they're unable to cope with and they see it as the only option. You know, they may see it as an option, but suicide is a permanent problem to a temporary, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So we always want people to know that. So what are some of the warning signs that caregivers should be aware of? So some things that caregivers should be aware of is, you know, physical changes in appearance or hygiene. Maybe they're dressing differently. They're not taking care of themselves in the way in which they normally do. Um, sometimes in some uh, teens, we see that maybe they're not wearing their hair a certain way or their makeup changes. You know, these might be indicators. There might also be an increased use of alcohol and drugs. Um, sometimes they might be... Uh, trying those or utilizing those more. Um, sudden drop in grades might be an indication as well. Perhaps they're a student who has a certain average and you see that their, their grades are starting to suffer. That might be an indication. Social withdrawal, maybe they're not hanging out with their friends. Maybe they're not going to their extracurriculars as much. Um, there's also, you know, maybe they're talking about suicide or they have a sudden preoccupation with death. You know, we might also see them researching methods of suicide. Maybe they're engaging in self-harming behaviors, you know, uh, cutting, burning, sometimes picking, pulling out their hair. These could also be signs of self-harm that might be, you know, warning signs for caregivers. And they also may talk about feelings of helplessness or hopelessness or not having any reason to live. These are some indicators we could look out for. So talk going back on the alcohol and drug use, does that increase the risk of suicide? It could increase the risk of suicide. We have suicide. We have to think about how alcohol and drugs do affect the brain biochemically. When we're talking about utilizing certain substances like alcohol, for example, that's a central nervous system depressant. So if someone's using alcohol, they're most likely going to feel more depressed. So when we start playing with the chemistry of our brain, it can affect the way in which maybe we, you know, our judgment may be impaired. Maybe we make choices that are more risky or, or more uh, self-harming. We also might be, you know, impeding our ability to make healthy choices. So alcohol and drugs can be a factor, and they might also Im increase someone's frequency of having these negative thoughts. So does talking about suicide increase the risk of suicide? So this, I'm so glad you asked this question, Ro, because this is something that we really need to talk about. No, this is such a myth. Talking about suicide does not put the idea of suicide in somebody's head. It does not increase the risk of suicide. If anything, talking about suicide saves lives. So if we can have a dialogue about suicide, especially with someone who's having suicidal ideation or maybe is you know, thinking about attempting, we can potentially save their life by letting them know like, hey, I know this is a scary thing to talk about, but it's an okay thing to talk about. You know, having thoughts of suicide isn't dangerous. It's what we do with those thoughts or the choices we make that make it dangerous. And like you said earlier, you know, suicide is the lead is the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24. So it's so important that we talk about it with them and we normalize that conversation. 
So why isn't it talked about more in society? You know, we like to think that we're stigma free and that, you know, mental health is so mainstream and we can talk about it and it's so acceptable, but there is still a bit of a taboo around it because it's uncomfortable. Talking about suicide can be super uncomfortable, especially if you're not super familiar with the language or talking about feelings in general. So to have these uncomfortable conversations or to have this stigma or this assumption that if I talk about it, someone's going to do something, it makes it kind of stay in the dark. And we don't want that to stay in the dark. This is something we really want to talk about and bring into the light because it's such an important dialogue. But again, people are uncomfortable because it's a scary topic. And we're afraid that if we talk about it, someone's going to do something and we don't want to harm anybody, you know, but it does need to be talked about and it does need to be more normalized in society. So how can parents and caregivers approach this topic? So the best advice I can give in regarding approaching the topic is just just use as unambiguous language as you can be direct you know we can still be compassionate and we can still be soft but we have to be direct are you thinking about killing yourself are you having thoughts of suicide you know oftentimes we want to use like lighter language like are you thinking about hurting yourself are you thinking about you know are you having bad thoughts you know yes it's great to ask if they're having these thoughts but we want to be direct because we want to talk about the topic we don't want to skirt around the issue so just letting our teens know that we want to help and we can talk about these things is super important you know we want to be sensitive to the topic and let them know it's safe to talk about you know approaching it in the line along the lines of like you know are you thinking about having are you having suicidal thoughts are you thinking about killing yourself and saying something and letting them know I want you to know that I'm here for you and that I'm always here for you if you want to talk. And I promise I'm going to listen and I promise I'm going to be open minded. And is there anything I can do to make myself more available to you? Is there anything I can do to support you? This is a really great way to have the dialogue, to let them know, hey, I'm going to talk about it with you and I'm in it with you. So is age a factor? I mean, if an 11, an 11 year old shows um, suicidal ideation in comparison to um, you know, somebody that's 17 in comparison to somebody in their 20s, would there be a different approach? There would be probably a different approach, especially depending on language. You have to think about like the language skills of an 11 year old compared to a 17 year old are much different. So if I go to a 17 year old and say, hey, are you having thoughts of suicide? They're going to be more understanding of what the topic is. For an 11 year old, I might need to be a little bit more mindful of the language. You know, that might be one of these situations in which we're tempted to say, hey, are you thinking, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? We still want to use the right language. Like, hey, are you thinking about ending your life? Are you thinking that, you know, you you don't want to live anymore? That might be language that's a little more approachable for an 11 year old. And we might need to describe what that looks like to them, which can be scary, but we have to also use it as an opportunity to educate because an 11 year old might not know what suicidal ideations or thoughts are. They might not know what suicide is. They just might know, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to wake up anymore. That might be something that's more along the lines of their level of understanding. So what kind of questions do you ask someone if you're worried about their mental health in general? Um, in general, you can ask questions. You know, we want to ask specific questions, I think, especially when it comes to um, like somebody you're close with. Ask direct questions. Just questions like, hey, I've noticed that you are not answering your phone as much, or I've noticed that you haven't been, you know, wearing your make wearing makeup as often, or maybe something along the lines of, hey, you seem down, like something that you observe in them. Like, I've noticed that you don't, you know, want to come out with us as much, or you're not talking to, to your friends and your family as much. Using specific questions and letting somebody know that you care about them and you've been, you know, observing this lets them know that you're paying attention and that they matter someone cares about them and someone is looking at them and saying, I want to know that you're okay. So I always like to use that as an approach, being specific and seeing what, saying what I observed. So what if you're not sure of the answer and, and it seems like they're resisting or, you know, they're like, it's not a big deal. Leave me alone, mom. I mean, you know, we've all heard it, you know, it's overwhelming. You don't want to overstep them. You know, you want to trust them. But in the same token, you're having the back of your mind, am I doing the right thing? You know, I don't want to hover, but there's definitely a significant change in their, you know, in their mental state. So that's a really hard place to be, you know, and, you know, we as clinicians experience that too. Yeah, maybe we have teenage 
uh, clients who come in and say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, but we're observing something else. So I, I'm sure as a parent it must, or a caregiver, it must be very frustrating. You know, if there's still this idea, you still have this gut feeling like, hey, I don't think this is normal. I don't think this is their behavior. I think there's something wrong and I want to be there for them. You know, sometimes we need to utilize crisis management. And, you know, those crisis management tools can be the National Suicide Hotline, the text line. It could be 262 Help. But, you know, I know it's very difficult because we don't want to be alarmist and we don't we, we're fearful that, you know, if I'm kind of approach this and I start using resources, that my, my team's gonna clam up. They're not gonna wanna talk to me anymore. I think it's important to kind of just push the issue in a gentle way. Like, I, I hear you say you're okay. However, this is what I'm seeing and th this is why I'm concerned. I care about you and I'm concerned. And also too, if your teen is maybe in, you know, supportive services, like they have a therapist, maybe they're working with their school counselor, utilizing those other support systems so we can have a collaborative approach and have more than one set of eyes on the teen and also more than one set of hands to help them can be a really great resource. So it's always important to use resources. So what are the risk factors that are unique to teens in suicide? The risk factors for teens are probably that there is a certain level of, um, for lack of a better word, invincibility. You know, we think that we're young and things can't happen to us. And if I do this, it might not happen. But for teens, we're also talking about, again, language. You know, maybe they don't have the emotional maturity or the emotional language to express how they feel. You know, again, maybe they have this feeling that I don't want to live anymore or I don't want to wake up anymore, but maybe they don't identify that this is a real serious problem. And, you know, for teens, there's oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes there is a lessened ability to have impulse control. So they are maybe more impulsive. They make decisions more on the fly as opposed to maybe thinking things through, utilizing a resource, talking to somebody. It's more doing than talking about it. So that might be one of the increased risk for teens. So let's talk a little bit about the resources that teens can utilize. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to talk to your caregiver, to talk to your parent, you know, or even just to talk to your friends. I mean, um, I know that there's teens that are very resistant to negative, you know, attention, right? Sure. Although there's some that, you know, like the negative attention and that's another, that's a whole other piece. But mm -hmm. what kind of resources can we, you know, make available to teens that they feel they can feel comfortable enough to reach out and say, hey, you know what, I, I'm not I'm not doing well. Mm -hmm. I think the first part of that is creating a culture in which we make a teen feel safe talking about mental health. I think that's the first step. We have to build a foundation in which a teens are able to say, like, something doesn't feel right and I need to talk about it. So I know that I can talk about it because it's OK to talk about it. So that's, I think, the foundation of it. The next thing is making sure that there's resources in all areas of their life. When they're in school, making sure they have access to their school counselor. If they maybe need a private therapist, get them that. If they need to be in a support group, that's something we could talk about too. You know, we recently opened the IOP in our outpatient department and teens are part of that program. Maybe it's having them go to an IOP program and have a mental health professional work with them three days a week so they can get more support. You know, it's making sure that they know that there are people here you can talk to. And listen, not every teen wants to talk to their parent about their mental health. That's okay. So having like a non-biased third party is such a great resource for kids. And also having a peer support group, letting other letting teens know I'm not the only one who feels like this. My situation is unique, but my feeling is something that other people have. Peer support is such a big thing, especially for that age group, to know they're not alone and to know that they can relate to other teens and that there's other teens feeling that way, that's a huge, huge support. So how can we help the caregiver and the parent? You know, it's got, it's overwhelming. Even, you know, I've heard stories just recently mm -hmm. from very good friends of mine that are, are going through stuff at home. You know, it's, it's overwhelming to hear that they're going through it and they really, they're, work, they're walking eggshells. They're not sure what to say, how to say it. You know, if they're making a big deal, what to get, you know, help. So how do you how do adults and caregivers, um, you know, work through their own resources to assure that they're get, giving the support their loved one needs? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Absolutely. And, you know, 
part of being a support system is getting educated. So for caregivers and for parents, you know, maybe that means getting involved with the school counselor as well. Maybe they have resources. Maybe they might know, you know, some skills or tools that might be helpful. You know, if your child has a therapist, talking to the therapist, collaborating with the therapist, finding out, you know, especially uniquely to your child or your teen, knowing that, hey, this is what's kind of coming up in session. This might be helpful to talk about. Maybe you can approach it this way. But also, too, doing the research. You know, NAMI has so many great resources that parents can read up on. Maybe they don't want to go and talk to somebody. Maybe they might feel uncomfortable. Going online and utilizing resources like NAMI. Um, Zero Suicide Academy is another great, you know, website to use. They have so many resources about teens and suicide and how to talk to teens. And also maybe using hotlines themselves. You know, these are resources not only for the teen, but for the parent. You know, it, it works on all sides. Everybody has to be a part of the solution so we can help fix the problem. So aside from encouraging using the resources and, mm -hmm. you know, going to therapy, is there any other way of preventing that? Just talking about it, being present and talking about it. You know, sometimes it means we want to make the environment safe. If even whether that means emotionally and physically, maybe we can make the environment safe by if you have a teen maybe who's self-harming or thinking about self-harming, you know, hiding sharp objects, making sure if they're on psychiatric medications, making sure that you know where those meds are, making sure they have the right amount of meds, not giving them access to extra. Maybe it also means, you know, helping make the environment emotionally self is safe, making sure that your environment is clean and, and organized for the teen and, you know, knowing that they have a space that they can go to that they can feel safe. That's important too. So what's the most important thing that you feel that viewers should take away from this talk today? If there's anything I would love viewers to take away from our talk is that it's okay to talk about suicide. You should talk about suicide with someone you're concerned about. And if you're scared, that's okay. That is valid. It is a scary thing to talk about, but don't be afraid to talk about it because talking about it saves lives. Not talking about it is what hurts people more. So if you could just open up that dialogue and it's going to be uncomfortable, but sometimes that uncomfortability can be the, the make all the difference in someone's lives. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Darian. You know, um, this is a difficult thing to talk about, yes. um, you know, uh, especially with, with certain age groups, you know, and cultures. Both. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think that it, it's a great resource. You know, I'm hoping that viewers will feel a little bit more comfortable and, you know, have a little bit more tools in their toolbox that yeah. they'll feel that they'll be able to talk to a loved one about, you know, suicide um, and, you know, it, it feel comfortable enough to say, hey, are you OK? Yeah. You know, and it's OK not to be OK. You know, it that's is. another that's another piece. Um, you know, and before I leave you, you know, something just popped up in my head. We talked a lot about young people, um, you know, and I, I have to, I'm at a miss if I don't mention geriatric. Um, mm. You know, I know that as you get older, you know, as, as we get older um, and we, and, and again, we're caregivers, we're taking care of parents and, you know, um, as you get older, I know suicide is very prevalent in geriatric patients. Is there a, a word of wisdom that you can share with caregivers about geriatrics? Sure. Um, I think the advice is kind of universal. Talk about it. You know, I, I think, you know, you, you bring up a great point in the culture and the age group. You're talking about an age group that didn't talk about mental health, that didn't talk about suicidal ideation or suicide in general, you know, so you're talking about something that's going to be pretty taboo, but just letting the geriatric or let, letting your, your loved one know if you're thinking about this, it's okay. And I'm here to talk to you. And you might be met with some resistance because we don't talk about that. It's not, that's a no go, but mm -hmm. you know, just reintroducing the topic slowly, but surely might be a way in which you can kind of open up that dialogue, build that safety, build that trust. And maybe in through building that relationship around the topic, it can become a little bit more um, accessible for them or a little bit more easy for them to talk about. Thank you so much. And um, if you know someone close to you who's struggling with mental health conditions, you can contact our Access Center at 1-800-730-2762. And it was great having you, Darian, and you know, really shedding a lot of light on the subject. I appreciate it. And um, you know, for Suicide Prevention Month. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having me. Thank you. Take care. You too.